Hello, I'm Karen Ross and I'm going to be your guide through this section of the unit on gendered language in the media. The ways in which we speak about language, the words that we use, are never just words, never just language. We make conscious choices about the words we choose which, if we look a little deeper, reveal the assumptions we make about the world and the point of view we take about this or that issue. If we do this in our everyday use of language between ourselves, consider how much more powerful the media are in framing issues through the use of particular terms, particular phrases. If someone is described as a freedom fighter, that person is being given a positive value by the use of the word freedom, a notion which we probably all agree is something good. If, on the other hand, the same person is described as a terrorist, then we are encouraged to view that person negatively as acting against us. It is still the same act, but how the person taking the action is described says something very important about the sympathies of the writer. If we then add woman to the descriptor, then our understanding of the person may well change again, as we probably assumed that the person was a man. Knowing that it was a woman is likely to make us think differently about the person, but why should it? Her sex made no difference to her act. It only makes a difference to how we interpret the act. Although we're talking specifically about language in this unit, text and image, words and pictures, work together to produce a way of looking at the world which is constructed rather than naturally occurring. The media may not tell us what to think, but they tell us what to think about. While social media is subverting the power and authority of mainstream media, traditional genres and formats still play an important role in opinion formation. And understanding the ways in which language operate is crucial for developing media literacy skills. Let's take the example of sex and gender, terms which are often used interchangeably, but are actually very different in their meaning. Sex refers to biology, which for our purposes means that someone is biologically female or male. And although there is a certain ambiguity for some people, the vast majority of us are biologically one sex or the other. Gender, on the other hand, is a socially constructed term which is operationalized to prescribe how women and men should behave, how we should be in the world. It is not only constructed, but also highly contested. If we use our woman terrorist example again, are we more outraged by her actions because she's transgressed what we think of as appropriate behavior for a woman? And what if she's also described as a mother? Such details are rarely included in news reports about men. So why are they deemed relevant in stories about women? A significant part of the feminist project for the past few decades has been to show how gender constructs of femininity and masculinity are rooted in patriarchal social formations which prescribe and constrict women's agency and autonomy in order to preserve the domination of men. So two key terms which we use in this course are gender and patriarchy, both of which we argue are invested with a both a political and a feminist ideology, at least in relation to the majority of feminist media scholarship which is focused on the relationship between gender and media. Because of the complexity of language and its contested nature, a number of glossaries have been constructed which attempt to define some of these key terms used in discourses around gender, sex and sexuality. So let's consider some of those. The European Institute for Gender Equality, AJA, has developed a gender equality glossary and thesaurus, 
which is extremely comprehensive, with terms developed from a wide range of sources, all of which are cited. Age's working definition of gender is this. Social attributes and opportunities associated with being female and male and to the relationships between women and men and girls and boys, as well as to the relations between women and those between men. And it goes on to say this. These attributes, opportunities and relationships are socially constructed and are learned through socialization processes. They are context and time specific and changeable. Gender determines what is expected, allowed and valued in a woman or a man in a given context. In most societies, there are differences and inequalities between women and men in responsibilities assigned, activities undertaken, access to and control over resources, as well as decision-making opportunities. Gender is part of the broader socio-cultural context other important criteria for socio-cultural analysis include class, race, poverty level, ethnic group and age. Gender-based assumptions and expectations generally place women at a disadvantage with respect to the substantive enjoyment of rights such as freedom to act and to be recognised as autonomous, fully capable adults, to participate fully in economic, social and political development and to make decisions concerning their circumstances and conditions. Gender is also an important term to understand in the context of gender identity. I have highlighted some parts of that definition to make clear that although the term gender is taken to include both women and men, it is usually brought into play in relation to issues of inequality between women and men. It also mostly assumes that women are more disadvantaged than men in terms of prescribed behaviours and life chances. What's also important to note, both in this definition but more generally, is the idea that gender is a learned behaviour and, as Judith Butler puts it, is also performed. It is perhaps not surprising then that media professionals, like everyone else, have learned to perform their gender and so often replicate those gender-based assumptions in the language they use to frame stories about women and men. Gender is a construct, so human agency has been involved in its development and definition. Indeed, recent debates have added another layer of complexity to the concept of gender through discussions about transgender, gender fluid, non-binary, and other terms which refuse biology as the basis of identity. However, for our purposes, we continue to talk here about women and men as political categories of difference, which constitute the basis of inequalities in society. One of the main ways in which to understand gender as construct is to understand societies in which women are subordinated to men as patriarchal. As with gender, patriarchy is also included in many glossaries of terms. For example, here's a definition taken from the UN Women's Gender Equality Glossary. This term refers to a traditional form of organising society which often lies at the root of gender inequality. According to this kind of social system, men, or what is considered masculine, is accorded more importance than women, or what is considered feminine. Traditionally, societies have been organised in such a way that property, residence and descent, as well as decision-making regarding most areas of life, have been the domain of men. This is often based on appeals to biological reasoning. Women are more naturally suited to be caregivers, for example, and continues to underlie many kinds of gender discrimination. What this definition demonstrates is that there's always some kind of justification for determining who should be in control through appeals to biological predisposition, as in this definition, or through religious teachings, 
or other bases, none of which have been determined by women.